Good morning those of you, to those of you on the Western Hemisphere and good afternoon and good evening for those of you connecting from the Eastern side of the world. We are delighted to welcome you to this OTC panel session. My name is Mariela Araujo Fresky. I am currently a commercial delivery manager working with Shell based in Houston. Our panel topic for today is innovation in offshore energy production from development to scale up implementation. This session will explore new technologies and innovations and discuss methodologies under development aiming to reduce offshore project costs and improve the value of operations. Our panelists will include representatives who have been intimately related with identifying, developing, commercializing, implementing, and operating offshore projects in a cost-effective way using new innovations and technologies. This panel session is being sponsored by AECHE, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. In terms of the format for the panel today, each of the panelists will share a brief presentation followed by a discussion, you know, um, and after that, we will open up the panel to Q&A from the audience. If you have any questions or comments, we would like to invite you to start typing those in the comment box. Our moderator today is Mika Tienhara, the CEO of Roxol, a technology company based in Finland. He has a mechanical engineer degree in manufacturing and energy technology, as well as an MBA. Mika has more than 15 years of stream experience in oil and gas, more than 30 publications, and a successful record of technology commercialization with more than 20 technologies worldwide. With this introduction, I pass the floor to Mika. Welcome, Mika. Thank you, Mariella. I hope you have had a good start of the day. And dear all, good morning, afternoon, and evening. This is the power of technology. It's a virtual panel session, and we're spread out in various time zones and different countries. My hope is, of course, that we can make this a very exciting and interactive event. Uh, as Mariella said, we hopefully get, can get some good questions also from the audience later on. And uh, we will start off with some presentations by the panelists. And on behalf of the Offshore Technology Conference, I feel honored to be moderating this virtual session on innovation. Personally, I think that this topic is highly relevant. Uh, we have a pandemic still raging around the globe. There is an energy transition ongoing. We see a lot of, uh, let's say, changes in the operating structures and organizations. We want to implement and driving the tech digitalization in the industry. So I think oil and gas has to rely even more on innovation in the times coming. And of course, these are pretty tough or heavy challenges to tackle. And we're not going to put all the burden on, on the panelists. But hopefully, we can learn something, all of us, uh, create some new ideas, and get some actions to move forward and engage more in collaboration. But enough said. I think we are all eager to get going. So um, our first speaker will be Pablo Reali, head of the oil and gas division uh, with Suez Water Technologies and Solutions, and he's based in Paris, France. So please, Pablo, you have the honor to be the first one on the floor, on the virtual floor. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mika. Uh, OK, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Am I? Is it sharing already, please? And if you put it in presentation mode, then it's perfect. It's coming. OK, we are there. OK, thanks for intro the introduction, Mika. I'm going to be telling you about uh, how some um, mega trends towards lower carbon economy and energy transition are shaping our innovation. So let me just introduce very, very briefly 
who we are and what we do. So Swiss has been delivering water and environment solution for the energy sector, sector for more than 70 years now. We are coming from a legacy, the Gremont and G Water, in what comes to be now Swiss Water Technologies and Solutions. So in the past, our position was one of a solution provider, helping our clients being efficient and environmentally compliant. And uh, from these mega trends that I mentioned, and from uh, some client survey, we did our, a survey which was biased on, on the things that we could be offering to the market. Of course, it was uh, interested in, in, in finding in what should be concentrating our, our effort. We had some main outcomes around low carbon, energy efficiency, sustainability, greenhouse emissions. So it happened to be that these are same interests that we have for our, our own industrial activity. So we are also operators in some uh, in uh, in some energy things like uh, taking biogas, taking uh, energy from waste. So we have share the share of those objectives, and we have now we are going into a novel position in which the solution we are developing for ourselves are the same that we are able to share with the with the market. So what are these drivers and how we integrate them into our vision? So Swiss has a main vision and a main commitment, which is reducing our CO2 emissions, our carbon footprint by 45% in 2030. This is quite uh, an important one. How do we count achieving this? We're going to achieve that through energy efficiency, carbon capture, it is a mix, carbon capture, reduction of fugitive emissions, and some other um, initiatives, offset. So these solutions, as I said, I'm going to be telling about, we are developing them from us and can be also shared with the, with the energy sector. And the interesting thing is that in these, we are taking a collaborative approach. So we are not alone in developing them. This makes a very good ground to, to, do the, to, to develop them in collaboration and so to accelerate their development and deployment. And maybe let me say at uh, last but not least at all, is that sustainable solution must make economic sense. So this is not philanthropy. This we are going to what we do is things that are deployable and are cost effective as well. So I'm going to be going through three examples of uh, of uh, what we are doing now as innovation. Uh, so I pass through the first case. First case is a is a very nice initiative that has been kicked off very recently and is around the net zero TSI project. So there is a project to build or to turn an industrial cluster in the UK into a zero carbon cluster. And this involves uh, many industrial players. You see some of them in the, in the industrial cluster, but mainly a main player is BP, who is building a pipe and a carbon storage place in the North Sea. And the uh, Swiss is planning to build a carbon capture facility for our energy production from waste plant that is going to be sending the capture carbon to the pipe and storage site by BP. For that, we have signed an MOU just a few days ago. The, the project, which is at feed at this moment, implies the capturing and storage of 200,000 tons per year of CO2, expandable to three lines that we have in the site. And the interesting thing is from this project and collaboration, we are shifting technologies from the oil and gas to the oil and gas and to some other, uh, some other uh, sectors. So, what is this built upon? This is built upon our knowledge in gas sweetening and gas treatment. So we've been doing, so I don't want to, to, to go through all the, this uh, flow diagram, but what this is presenting is what we used to do as CO2 separation from natural gas, and we keep doing, and what we did as gas dehydration, all this is applicable to post-combustion combustion gases. So out of our knowledge, we are developing the best applicable technology for capturing effectively the, the CO2. We're applying, this is using new kind of, uh, of solvent. So we are applying electrodialysis from water treatment. This is applicable for uh, solvent reclaim. So prolonging the, the life of the solvents. 
and uh, regeneration, the hydration, these are all things that we're applying together, plus together with our offer for, for um, remote monitoring and chemical conditioning of these systems, we believe we are going to be able to deliver a comprehensive solution in, a, in an economical way. Economical means this is a race towards doing this, the less cost possible, possible and the less energy consuming possible. So all these together, we believe we're going to be playing a, a, a role in the carbon capture playground in the time to come. Second one, that is a, another one which is collaborative. So this one is evolution in the wellhead descending technology. So this is a site uh, by Conoco. This is something we are doing in the US. Uh, the, and involves, I'm going to go a little bit more. So once again, it's a cooperative and it's economically sound. What is it about? So traditional technology for doing uh, descending at well heads, well heads consists on what's called a sand trap. Sand trap, which is a high pressure vessel that separates sand by gravity and sand is being removed from that by conveying it with the gas that is trapped in the, that it's in the, in the main uh, flow. So that means each time this sand is extracted, this is done manually, and this is done by venting a big amount of uh, gas methane, which is a big greenhouse impact. What we are developing together it's a new cyclonic wellhead descender, which is fully automated. This is something which is not usually applied in, in these operations. It is it it uh, has a separate uh, two compartments, so there is no gas seeing the atmosphere. Sand is conveyed by water, and as a result, this is a more sophisticated equipment, but that does not use labor at all, it's uh, working fully automated, it's monitored by remotely, doesn't pose any, any health risk due to sudden venting of high pressure gases. It saves a huge amount of CO2 equivalent in terms of gas, uh, of, uh, gas uh, vented, and it makes economical sense. So it's cheaper to do this, which is higher tech than, do, than use the traditional one. So that has been a, the, the site I've shown in the previous picture is a real demonstration site. We did, we've done three now and we're going live with a real business uh, next year. And maybe to finish is one which is exclusively for the offshore. And this is coming from a, a trend that we see in the market, which is a increased environmental pressure on the discharge to the sea. So for the ones familiar with topsoil operation, you know that, uh, 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 and especially in deep sea operations, you know that uh, to keep pressure in, in the reservoir, what is uh, done is uh, seawater is taken from the sea and is treated to remove sulfate, to remove solids and to remove sulfate to, to avoid the scaling and to remove oxygen. And then this is uh, uh, injected. This offshore uh, market we see a very active this year, and I'm happy to say that we have gotten two of these models within the picture, one for an operation in Senegal, one for an operation in Brazil. And the thing that we've seen is that uh, there's been a tendency in the implementation of ultrafiltration as the method for, uh, for uh, pre-treating the water, which is more sophisticated to the previously one that used that was a media filter and cartridge filters. And the interesting thing is that we see this tendency to um, impose stricter uh, limits for discharge, which means that what you see in the, in the lower part, it is the produced water that was separated from the seawater injection. So it was the, the commonly solution today is to just treat that water and discharge it overboard. The new restrictions are making that more difficult and obliged to add a polishing step. And the interesting here in our, in our uh, proposal is that we have 
proven in the lab and in, in pilots that we are able to treat that same produced water with the same type of UF that we apply for seawater. What does it mean? That an environmental restriction that would make water discharge more expensive is bringing us to a possibility to use that produced water for reinjection instead of diverting to the sea. And that means that it's going to be cheaper to treat the produced water and reinject it and make smaller seawater injection module. And even in the future, it can be possible to switch trains from the, from the seawater part to the produced water uh, train as the water cut increases. So the interesting thing is that it's sustainable, zero discharge, and profitable. And maybe to say, and this is another issue which is uh, quite common in the sector, is that everyone wants to be the second, no one wants to be the first. So we have a way in which we really were going to be able to push this one to come out of the paper and to, or, or the pilot and to be real, which is the fact that we are, uh, we are uh, willing to take or to the risk the, the adoption of this, this new way of, of doing. Uh, which um, would be we are we are operators, so we trust that we can operate that uh, properly. We are manufacturer of the membranes, so we trust we may trust more our membranes than the adopter, and we are service provider for chemicals and membrane care. So that means that we are able to take the risk of this, assume ownership of this new technology, and sell the membranes as a service. That means that the oil operator could take our new technology and our membranes and pay by the time, by the day, or by the volume of water treated. So we believe this, for this, we are looking for the right partner. I, we hope uh, we are exploring it with uh, some candidates, and we hope in the near future we're going to be able to accelerate from going from pilot to application. So maybe just to finish now. So innovation towards sustainability has to be collaborative based on shared targets. The trends for, to, towards energy transition is happening and is a one way. So it concerns all the value chain. And uh, I think it's, a, it's, as I say, it's one way and it's not going to come back or backwards. Solutions have to make economical sense. So we work on, on real applicable solutions. And we're going to stay along the energy sector, developing this to make the, the world and the economy sustainable for all of us. So I think that's it. And I guess the questions are going to, to come later, if I understand well, Mika. So yes, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you for a comprehensive and good presentation covering uh, technology components and systems that actually can improve also the environmental impact and be commercially viable. So we move on to our next speaker. That will be Aruna Viswanathan, COO of Alpha X Decision Sciences based in Houston. Please go ahead, Aruna. The floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, Mika. And thank you, Mariella, and to the OTC staff for making this possible. Uh, this OTC Live, I think, has uh, been beneficial for all of us to be able to meet other people from around the world and hear about what's going on. So good day to everybody in the audience. Uh, my name is Aruna Viswanathan, CEO and co-founder of AlphaX Decision Sciences. We are a Silicon Valley and Houston-based software company uh, that delivers solutions to the energy industry based on artificial intelligence. And this presentation is going to focus on AI as the creatively destructive breakthrough innovation that will allow oil and gas to maintain profitability while managing the energy transition and transformation in the decade ahead. So I'm going to just go to my next screen. So let us focus on the reality of our current situation and uh, as erroneous assumptions can be disastrous. Uh, I'd like to spend a few slides to kind of peel back the veneer on uh, what has been going on and state some certain facts so that we can set the context for what we're going to discuss. So uh, let us first take a look at risks to our physical and data infrastructure. Uh, 
Those of us in Houston are certainly aware of what's happened in the 2020 hurricane season. You can see on the slide here, we had about 42 million barrels of crude oil that was curtailed in production due to hurricanes. And uh, that was almost 22 days of lost production, almost 1.9 million barrels a day. And this was all due to storms. And while we may disagree on the causes of climate change, we still have to contend as an industry with its effects. And that includes increasing temperatures, more hurricanes, more wildfires, and increased water scarcity. And that means that we need more AI solutions at scale that can help decrease non-productive time and enable production optimization. Um, the second slide deals with cybersecurity, and maybe it's a cliche, but allow me to state that cybersecurity is more than just about software. Our assets are IoT today, and so therefore our, we communicate and we preserve our knowledge digitally. And uh, this graph, uh, which was taken from a Cisco conference attendees group, uh, talks about cloud usage in different industries. And you can see that energy companies, 41% uh, of them already in one cloud, 33% in two, and interestingly, 37% in uh, use hybrid cloud solutions. And today, petroleum is the second most targeted industry for cyber criminals behind utilities. And as such, this is an area where, again, AI operations is allowing us to manage digital threats in a real-time fashion. So, I'm going to continue to talk a little bit more about some risks that we see associated with the energy transition ahead. And uh, so what we see is that many of the super majors have stated that they have goals to diversify. And that can be seen with new investments that they are making. Uh, the graph on the lower section talks about Shell in particular and their new equity investments over a decade. And you can see that there's a diversification into technology and renewables there. Uh, we've seen more recently even announcements by Halliburton Labs in Houston, uh, BP's investments towards renewables. I know our other panel speakers have talked are going to be talking about this. And even Baker has a goal to meet net zero by 2050. However, diversification uh, will to non-resource industries in particular will mean significantly different business models requiring tighter controls on budgets and much better forecasting ability. And as you can see in the other graph, uh, which is a Kimmeridge study, Kimmeridge is a oil and gas ENP investor of 80 publicly traded ENP companies. Uh, what they are plotting is the return on average uh, capital employed. And uh, you see a green line that's going up and this is US based production and oh, from 2000 to 2020. And you can see as production rises, the return on capital, which is the red line, actually materially decreases as companies took on high levels of debt, ultimately crushing equity investors in 2020. Um, and while public ENPs, I realize, are only part of the asset class, there's a lot of private money in the sector, they are the, the publicly visible area that people see and their performance reflects on the industry as an asset class. So we believe that AI has a material role to play in helping uh, make those business models sustainable and economically viable uh, by producing uh, information that helps us do much better forecasting. So what are the impacts of these trends? Well, these trends uh, go to effects on innovators, they go to effects on investors, employees, and consumers, and they speak to how pivotal uh, the decade is for innovation in upstream. Um, however, there's a lot of issues with adopting new technology in our sector, and this is not something that I think any of you in the audience listening today are unfamiliar with. Uh, this is part of the proverbial innovator's dilemma. However, it's made far worse by certain dynamics in our industry. And so bullet one, for example, in other industries, products are prototyped and developed in weeks and months, not years and decades. Uh, bullet number two, innovation, frankly, is stifled when there is a nine to 12 month sales cycle time. Bullet number three, when things are good, it takes forever 
to get new technologies into the marketplace. And when things are bad, frankly, we don't really even try that hard. Uh, can you imagine if we as an industry were responsible for getting a vaccine out to the public? Uh, bullet number four, ESG, uh, the environmental, sustainable and governance issues, they are a reality. The two panelists I have on this uh, call and our hosts are all very familiar. And uh, as international players, uh, their companies are deeply engaged. The new talent, though, is educated in a world where the environment and sustainability are considered ethical choices. And so as such, oil and gas needs to adapt. Uh, bullet five, I think this is self-evident for any of us who have ever tried uh, in any innovator in the oil and gas software space. How many software companies in our sector have made it to $100 million? Maybe three in the last two decades? Instead, our sector tries to kill software companies. We hire consultants uh, who don't threaten jobs. And lastly, not invented here is endemic across all large corporations. And yet we still, I believe, can take charge of our destiny and own the creative destruction of our own sector. Well, what would it take for us to do that, to truly transition and transform? Uh, we must gain new knowledge and apply it. Uh, in 100 years, physics has brought us to where we are. But if we are to have another 100 years, we believe that AI will be the backbone that takes us there. Uh, and the changes, I believe, uh, we believe are inevitable. Uh, there is diversifying to lower margin industries, such as renewables that we've been discussing. There is returning capital faster and more responsibly to our investors in a shorter period. And the facilitating and collection of what we are call ESG, environmental safety and governance metrics is important. Uh, these are still being shaped for the oil and gas industry. And so it gives us the opportunity to take control of the story. Uh, today, energy has dropped as an asset class within the S&P to 4%. Um, it has dropped considerably over the last decade, two decades, and it will not be considered an investable class unless it addresses these types of concerns. And we believe that AI, again, can help facilitate that. Uh, the reality is that the speed of network innovation, evolution, complexity, and change is difficult for humans to manage, much less the corporation. And AI possesses two unique characteristics that human beings simply don't. That is connectability and updatability. AI models can learn from millions of other models instantaneously, which is already happening at companies like Amazon and Tesla and that too in real time. So if you think about just how you use Google Maps, you may know how to get home. We have a ton of subject matter experts in this industry. You know how to do things, but just like with Google Maps, you do not know if there is traffic or a road closure on your way home. But driven by the power of the network, AI can give you more information at your fingertips to ensure that you make the right decision. And so in this new world, every workflow is an invitation for disruption. And we believe based on what we have seen in market that that is true for software in upstream. And so allow me to provide a few examples that uh, include some of the work that we've done. And uh, we're doing this live today, but in May of 2020, we put out a paper uh, which you can see the broadcast of as well, where we discuss the history of open source technologies like AI and how they are being constantly improved upon by academia and industry. And above uh, or in the screen here is are now common workflows for AI that have used open source technologies that were developed in other industries and reapplied in oil and gas. And when I say common, I do mean that they are, they have been proven and prototyped and developed and are in use to some level, but they are not necessarily at scale today. Um, of course, the problem is about getting to scale because at this current rate, it could be five to seven years before some of these things are truly at scale. 
unfortunately, uh, and I think that the audience would agree that that is simply an untenable time frame. Um, so let's move to, as I close, discussing a specific application of AI. So while Alpha X has a number of use cases to share, I'd like to focus on water uh, because its scarcity and therefore conservation has become an increasing area of concern. The graph, I'm oh, sorry, looks like this. Okay. The graph, which is produced from an intervis study, shows that water that has been used for hydraulic fracking in Oklahoma basins. And you can see that the orange uh, is actually in a, the Anadarko Basin, uh, which already has issues with drought. Um, so you can see that water planning is increasingly important in production economics, its availability, reuse, and disposal. And over the next decade, we believe that this is going to become under more and more increased scrutiny. However, it's not an area that we have traditionally spent a lot of time forecasting. And so I'll begin by positing a question. Has produced water been a first order consideration in our industry in terms of accuracy and economic cost? While each one of us may have a different answer, the facts are that no federal standard reporting exists in the US for water by oil and gas companies. Uh, it is different for different states. Uh, lack of verified data remains a hurdle. Even the data that's reported is not necessarily as accurate, for example, in water as it is for oil and gas. Uh, as such, how we understand the and forecast economic and social implications is a major problem today. And capital providers are increasingly interested and focused on these ESG concerns. And even if it wasn't coming from capital providers, as JPT in a recent article mentioned, produced water has become a $34 billion industry that exposes operators to numerous operational, environmental, and economic risks. So in that vein, rather than call it forecasting, you can see that we've been calling it water prediction. Uh, today, forecasting has typically been done with type curve analysis, application of water to oil ratios, and using a lot of aggregation. Uh, but that doesn't really speak to you know, the dynamic nature of the industry and the ability or need to do more ec better economic modeling as water becomes a larger part of the equation. So recognizing that production economics is going to require more updated and precise information for planning, uh, AlphaX has taken on the challenge to use AI to predict water at the individual well level, which is a highly nonlinear profile with a MAPE as low as 2% for well-behaved wells as to as high as 17%. This processing occurs for just a, in just a few seconds for over 10,000 wells enabled via the cloud and helps provide engineering and economic tools that can be updated as new data becomes available. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, we've reviewed our current state. Uh, we understand what must be done. If you can take only one thing away from this presentation, uh, it is what you see here on the screen. We believe that the time has come for oil and gas corporations to rewrite the social contract with the public, the employees, consumers, and the investors. And we believe that artificial intelligence can and will lead the way. Thank you, Mika, for the opportunity to present and thank you to our audience. Thank you, Aruna. This was well said. Uh, good message here at the end. And I, I hope this can give also some actionable thoughts on how we can remove barriers in the, in the industry. Uh, so we move over to Madrid in Spain for our final speaker here, uh, Federico Gianangeli, EMP Director of Technology with Repsol. Please go ahead and uh, we are eager to hear your presentation here, Federico. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike, uh, Mika, for that introduction. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I, I just was reminding when I will go to Houston for the OTC, so I hope that we can do this experience uh, in the closest proximity 
to uh, to that for all of you that are attending this panel. With that, uh, with that being said, uh, I'm I'm the director of uh, technology for uh, for Repsol, and uh, and today I'm going to give you a 15 minute slide deck journey that I have prepared, uh, which is which is structured mainly in three pieces. I I will need to go into some uh, company um, context so you you understand what the EMP in Repsol is uh, is going through. Uh, of course, that goes in hand with uh, evolution or what I would say the revolution of R&D and what we are framing as a change, a cultural change, uh, and therefore moving our mindsets towards a, a product uh, mindset. And, uh, and then I will, give, I will give you a quick uh, overview of some products applied to uh, some of our geographical areas in which we have uh, offshore operations. So to, to start with, uh, with the context, um, one, one year ago, um, our CEO actually made a statement to, uh, to the media that was associated to the com commitments of Repsol towards the society. And it was to become a net zero uh, carbon um, uh, company by 2050. And uh, so just two weeks ago, uh, we reinforced the Repsol position actually to the energy transition. and. Uh, I would say that uh, this is probably one of the most technological driven strategic plan that I have seen. I actually invite you to go and, uh, and review it. And you will find out uh, a mixture, I call it the cocktail of, uh, of messages. I mean, a mixture of, uh, of uh, biofuels, ecofuels, uh, waste to energy, green hydrogen, now, and NETs, which are negative emissions technologies, among other ones. Everything also towards developing a new business that or reinforcing the business of the renewables. So as the company is accelerating into this uh, energy transition, um, I would say that uh, you, you might recall that quote of Albert Einstein. He says, in the, in the midst of every crisis lies an, an opportunity, a great opportunity. Uh, the the question is uh, well how we how we are capturing these opportunities and roles. So what is the role of upstream in uh, in our case? And that leads me to the next uh, image, which is uh, the sort of analogy that I wanted to share with you. So everyone has realized. I mean, this is not a surprise that we are navigating through uncharted waters. I would say that uh, this is probably among the most uh, VUCA environments that I've been in the in the industry. Uh, so EMP. So EMP is uh, several things. Uh, I will probably make the story short by saying, from a number standpoint, if 4.5 billion contribution in the next year, billions of euros towards the energy transition. So it's one of the, what we call the two engines of the company from the free cash flow. So this put the EMP in a position of becoming a radical efficiently at the same time that we implement a strong decarbonization roadmap uh, to place our company in what we expect to be tier one among the lowest in the sector. Okay, But if you can think about this, uh, the radical efficiency needs uh, the help of uh, innovation. It's going to need the needs of, the, of innovation or what what many others will describe as doing things in a different way and hopefully better, of course, to get there. So remember something that innovation is, uh, is, is not only the way that we apply it to product development, but it's also the way that we are doing things, changing the ways that we are doing things. And we are facing that in these pandemic times uh, more than ever. So uh, this is a key challenge of the industry today of the EMP, how to keep those lowest, uh, the lowest break evens possible and bring at the same time technology to the picture. So this is why I share with you this analogy in this uh, picture, a pull talk. I mean, I'm not so sure if uh, you have seen, but uh, at least a video of, uh, of this puzzle is uh, it's really powerful, it's agile, it's trustful. So I compare at this point this pull talk uh, to that uh, R&D role. And the R&D goes together sometimes with the innovation implementation. So this is the way that we basically are looking into the future to shape the present. And the big FPSO or a tanker, et cetera, is that EMP, that free cash flow generator, it has a lot of focus on what is their mission, as I say before. And then the question is, I mean, how that link uh, of between technology innovation and the EMP in a period of time that EMP should not be distract uh, can bring um, that can reinforce that link of, of trust. And that link of trust is reinforced with impact. So what do we did in Repsol 
to navigate into that uh, technology um, revolution, as I mentioned before, and, uh, and become basically a, an R&D that uh, is bringing impact to, uh, to the company. And let me introduce you here what we call our catalog of, uh, of product. But first, we have before we get to this, uh, we have to go through a strong cultural change, uh, a strong connection of the R&D work with the business was key. So we decided, therefore, to bring uh, the concept of uh, product development. And this probably is more uh, natural in service companies, etc. But the product mindset uh, help us to navigate uh, from these ideas to real applications and therefore speaking the same language of the users and the clients. So with that cultural change, uh, the R&D is actually start to move automatically into an agile mindset, uh, thinking about uh, a short time cycle technology. And uh, Aruna was actually mentioned about that. I mean, what r and I mean, cannot be short term cycle technology development and, uh, and make product designs uh, thinking something natural. Uh, of course, that was not enough. Uh, we we find out that uh, the product ownership was a really key component of all of this. So that we took uh, product owners from the business, from the EMP, because they needed to have a skin on the game. That was the best way to ensure that uh, we have uh, a technology that is not only developed, but is also adopted in the company. So that was key for the process. And, and of course, I mean, he and she, this is an interesting part, uh, also have the right or the stop doing call. Oh, I mean, uh, any time in which uh, things were not going into the impact or value to the to the EMP, then they could have the stop call. So the, the above took us some time. I mean, it positions Repsol uh, to, uh, to have a value driven catalog. Uh, you can see here the pieces of the catalog. And within these, I mean, we were able to develop uh, as uh, more, we have more than 35 uh, products today that uh, are actually delivering impact uh, to the business. So the lesson learned is that uh, from this was also that shortly we, we noticed that the best technology solution actually come from, uh, from the user. And, and now I'm going to go to that zooming of uh, how the funnel of work uh, technology in hand with the business and foreign business get us to some product. This is just a quick snapshot. Uh, it's the offshore technology conference of, of our offshore production. Uh, our amount 40% of the production actually is coming from offshore. And the products that I'm going to share with you are more in the in the areas that are highlighting as a North Sea, Gulf of Mexico and Brazil. And I think I have it in, in that order. Now, this is gonna be a, a glance, okay? And um, and I'm not gonna be touching in, on, in all of the products that we have developed, okay? But in that funnel that I was mentioning to you, we define what we call the pain points. I mean, everything that the business wanted to do and has some transversality in regards to the interest. So we bring together, I'm gonna talk to the blue, the light blue box, and then you can read through the information of the slide. So ethos and plane. I mean, ethos and planes comes, uh, the genesis is uh, how we can actually reduce the static model uncertainty. I mean, how we can capture more data I mean, without having expensive core in one core, for example, in the area of the North Sea could cost us of over $7 million. Uh, so with uh, no core in or sidewall core in, what we could do to actually improve uh, our center in the rest one. This is what is ethos and plans about. It actually includes uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, start from image recognition. We had a lot of competencies within Tech Lab, uh, which is the area of the company that works in the R&D uh, that we developed in the time in regarding to image recognition, like a high density image and also infrared image. So we are, were able to provide uh, uh, to, to basically create segmentation of those images to to generate uh, what we call a, a, a proxy or a pseudo log. And now, I mean, with uh, cuttings, for example, that uh, we can pick cuttings for every activity of development, we actually could uh, perform a petrophysic analysis and extrapolate properties of permeability and porosity in order to reduce the um, uncertainties of that static model. So this is a one snapshot that we are actually are using this uh, next year uh, in our uh, 
campaign for uh, for Norway. If I move to the Gulf of Mexico, you might see that the Red Sol has a position in the Gulf of Mexico, not only in Mexico, but USA side. We have exploration, also production assets. In, um, in particular to this area, I wanted to talk to you about ASI, which is the automatic seismic interpretation and the geomechanics. So the ASI, we, we were facing this situation of uh, how we can funnel the time of our geoscience, the ones that are doing seismic interpretation in a better way, how we can analyze that workflow of seismic interpretation and make some things uh, quicker by introducing AI and machine learning. So that's what is ASI about. It has functionalities of uh, automatic horizon extraction. I mean, faulting, uh, um, is interpreting all the fault things just to understand the risk of compartmentalization as well as uh, defining the salt boundaries that uh, was a feature that we find in almost all of our activities where we have the operations today so subsoil developments with that being said i mean we we actually applied uh, artificial intelligence uh, with uh, with these two so we we base uh, our analysis on imaging or actually even deep learning from years and years of experience of how we are doing the interpretation based on uh, azimuths or deep uh, in order to train um, a system that will give you the answer. In the geomechanics side, actually, we have a specific case that is uh, is uh, basking. I mean, if, uh, if you are aware about some of the challenges on the Gulf of Mexico is that we have pretty narrow uh mud windows uh, and what it means is that uh, you can move easily into a fracturing of the reservoir or a collapsing of the well because of the weight of your mud so the geomechanics becomes a really important product so we develop a 1d and a 3d system that actually can help you to do almost uh, uh, in real time hydraulic fracture propagation actually we use this product also for uh, defining the best orientation of the trajectory of the of the frac um stimulation of that well and that well uh, which was operated by llog at that time and uh, what was technical input from result from our products uh, uh it is produced uh, is, it is one of the highest performance wells on the on the wilcox area with a uh, twenty thousand barrels a day per production and uh, to finish with this uh, quick snapshot of the of the project i could not uh skip uh, the Kaleidoscope uh, and escort. Kaleidoscope is a is a is a great um is is it's a great case in which uh, we were able to commercialize a technology that we developed since 2008 and actually was one of the reasons why we were successful in the offshore of Brazil. Kaleidoscope suite of products is uh, basically um how to improve uh, your seismic imaging is make it sharper it make it better it use a uh, reverse time migration full wave inversion desalting uh techniques and uh, recently we use uh we we get an agreement one year ago we get an agreement because we we thought that the best way to extrapolate this uh uh this product was through the um democratization of that and the best way to do it was to partner with in this case with emerson and we were able to get a user friendly user friendly inter a user interface with our geoscience science in order to uh, get it accessible to the full community of the geoscience. science and last but not least that uh, x -Core, i mean we we find uh, as a pain point an opportunity to challenge commercial models uh, that have, uh, you know, they work on existing standards and therefore sometimes the recommendation of uh, material selection when there is corrosive uh, environments. In Brazil, we were facing a high CO2 uh, reservoir situation. So the recommendation from specifications could be uh, heavily into um, um, what we call like a gold plating or a selection of material that uh, is not necessarily required. So with XCore, we were able to have a far way more accurate envelope of the flow assurance uh, challenges and therefore select the material that uh, in those cases in which it was giving us an over conservative case, we could go back, for example, from a uh, super duplex to a carbon steel and reduce the cost of our project. So I know that this was uh, pretty quick and uh, so what I wanted to, the, the key takeaways that I want, I would like you to get uh, from this uh, presentation and see that this is a move now. 
Oh, sorry, I just noticed that I did a click on the Brazil part, but uh, I hope you you get that one. And uh, but um, sorry for that. But uh, the the key takeaways that uh, I would like to um, you to get from this is, uh, I mean, number one, allow yourself time to be innovative. Uh, what is not part of your agenda uh, is just not important. So innovation needs to take. Uh, part of our time more than ever. So innovate in your process as well as in your product. Uh, but most importantly, I would say that innovate with your product owners and your users. And uh, do not underestimate all the uh, accomplishments that you can get with the strategic alliances. And uh, last but not least, I mean, never lose sight of generating impact. R&D needs to generate impact. It will fail, but at the end of the day, it also needs to get uh, uh, R and D. Uh, the R and D needs to create uh, results, and uh, do do not underestimate also the short term oriented product. Uh, but this should not be uh, or blurry the long term view. Remember, at the end, we are the polling talk of uh, that is leading the the path to our extraordinary result. And that's uh, the presentation uh, that I have for you today. And I want to thank you, and I pass uh, the floor back uh, to. Mika. Thank you, Federico. Uh, that was an insightful presentation, and I love your tugboat picture there. But in 10 years' time, Federico, I hope we can change the tugboat, or, or let's say the big FPSO, to some <laughs> race boat or something, that we are actually moving ahead with, with, uh, with speed and impact. So um, th thank you, all three. We've been through the first part of this uh, virtual session with the presentations to give a certain flavor and direction uh, for the next part now, where we start with um, uh, yeah, some questions and, and uh, discussions around the topics. In the meantime, of course, you as uh, a participant here can also post questions in the comments field and we will look at those and pick up some also for the uh, panelists here to discuss so um, while you're doing that and listening to us uh, we'll get started here and um, i actually want to go back here and and start on a one topic that i heard also from uh, coming several times and I would like to kick this off to Pablo. You've been silent for a while now. So, uh, so we, the ongoing energy transition and need for this, let's say, energy efficiency, et cetera, and what you're doing at T-Side. Um, in terms of innovation, if you look at that, and, and what do you think convinced BP to, to move ahead with you and, and do this project? Okay, let me say that we are... Uh, I have to be modest, we are a part of, of the project. So the project is, is involving a full cluster of industries. So BP, we are working with BP on, on, on one part, we're not the only one, but uh, I would say, I mean, we are working with BP and we're working on gas treatment project for BP, now in Azerbaijan and in many others. So we've been working constantly with them you know how it is. You have to get qualified. You have to be trusted. You have to deliver. So, and now we are have a com we are have converging interests, if you wish. And the, I think that the novelty is that we are now embarking the same. So, the 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 nice thing about this kind of project is not one part of the country we're both on the same ship. So, I would say a trustable relation, long-term trustable relationship, and the the coherence of of, of, of objectives now. Understand, but all, uh, also, do you see that, let's say, doing this type of project now, does it require some new type of skill set or capabilities uh, in terms of the innovation and innovation ecosystem? Or is it more or less straightforward as it is? Uh, it's quite a wide question you're asking. So how, how do we come there? So let me say that... Uh, the push towards carbon capture has been uh, having a great push in the last uh, in the last uh, two years. I would say a new push. So we've been investing in real uh, in in basic R and D and piloting since the two thousands and until two thousand twelve two thousand thirteen, and that went a little down. So 
there was a there was many things knowledge and technology that have been there without a real driver in the market so sometimes you know how it is you you bet on some r d you put your your uh, your investment there and maybe some fundamentals are not met so so it doesn't proceed so one thing that is bringing We've been investing in basic uh, in basic research and, uh, and development in that. So now it is we are we are uh, we are uh, about to to harvest that. And yeah. uh, so there was a, a dedicated know-how in, in which we invested. And then there is also, as I said, this is a kind of an extension of a technology. So we have a bunch of technologies for treating either the gases that we applied and we kept applying on gases. So you have to do gas sweetening, you have to do gas dehydration. So with that, we keep uh, being very active. So we've done for BP gas dehydration in, in several cases. And uh, so that's about being able to shift some of the available knowledge to do something new. So this is not a completely changing the shape. It, it's kind of making evolve people to, to go into a new field. So I would say yes. both things were, were there. One is is basic uh, or, or applied R and D, and second uh, some uh, kind of re, re, re shifting the the focus. Yeah, People of course. I, I see that you have the let's say your track record, your capabilities, and then also the collaboration, etc., and, and moving into a, partly a new direction uh, with that load. But then let's see because here we have a good question from the audience too and i'm addressing this to federico uh, when Rep repsol is partnering you or in jv in blocks yeah in, in the emp sector uh, what is your experience in in terms of the development of innovation uh, is it easy within the oil and gas sector and this could tie into what actually pablo said a bit here yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, especially when they put the, the easy part in front of the oil and gas sector. But uh, to to address the to address the question, I, I think I have faced uh, bo both of the side. No, I mean there is actually something. Let me just start from the the pro innovation applied to JVs and uh, and also through the oil and gas. There is uh, some strategic partnerships that we do i mean i'm going to make the example of uh, mexico go from mexico mexico side uh, a pemex company looks uh, uh, as one of the requirements that uh, you are a company that are pushing the innovation products and uh, a part of the the value adding component of uh, bringing uh, a repsol in part of the partnership of developing blocks in the offshore is actually that you, you can prove yourself as a contributor of uh, innovation and technology so we have this type of situation that is even like a card uh, to entry into the jvs and into some of the blocks uh we have uh i have faced other situation in which uh for example uh we have some technology products that might be um that, that could apply uh, and their, their help to a decision of whether or not you should shoot more seismic or not to mm -hmm. get uh, more detailed information and uh, versus utilizing an AI and machine learning um, product that is, uh, is showing you that you can improve the image uh, probably as much as uh, the company that is shooting seismic is telling you that uh, you could have uh, improvement. So when you get into those debates, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to uh, to push uh, uh, product innovation in the benefit of uh, perhaps uh, reducing costs of a seismic acquisition campaign and rely more into this uh, AI uh, um, suite of products. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But of course, also, let's say you build your catalog like also other company or let's say EMP companies uh, in that sense. But, um, and then of course uh, you have the variability in oil and gas production uh, and, and, and from the whole, whole life of oil and gas in that sense. So how do you see this, let's say, uh, from going from a demonstration as a pilot, as a pilot. to actually yeah. being able to scale up? Have you, yes. have you seen successes there in terms of your technology portfolio? 
Sure. Um, yes, you think, I mean, when you when you think about R&D, of course, you, you have to allow yourself, first of all, a range of, uh, of failure. I mean, if you, if you are developing technology and you're developing products that are all good, you are doing something wrong. Uh, with with that being said, uh, the yes, I mean we we do have uh, tangible success when, when we I was explaining before when we went to the mindset of the catalog, uh, it could be for something really simplistic, but it it pushed the full organization uh, towards uh, impact. So uh, when we are developing the product. Uh, we actually define with the product owner. And remember that I mentioned that the product owner is in the business, it's in the asset, it has ground, it has foots in the ground. Uh, help us to steer the functionalities of the product to ensure that there is, um, there is impact. And not only that, I mean, they basically sign off for that and, and also uh, are responsible of the adoption in the company. So in regards to the impact, what we do is that we get to a minimum viable product, we define an impact, and then we track that. Uh, examples that I can give you, I mean, the X-Core product that I was talking about uh, before, I mean, uh, have that savings, uh, uh, allow us to cut some savings in material selection selection in a well in uh, Saka Kemaka that uh, we have also CO2 and uh, perhaps uh, uh, we could handle with a carbon steel. Uh, we have uh, also some, uh, I mean, applications of uh, another product that I didn't mention on the field development plan optimization. It's a way also on AI in which you can converge uh, the dynamic modeling with uh, optimizing multiple variables like an MPV and well location. And what the way that you save money is that uh, you use far away less uh, resources, so machine like uh, HPC. And uh, and that has also an, an important uh, cumulative right, in dollars. Thank you, Federico. So here we see a bit of aspects in terms of let's say innovation and new technology. So uh, Aruna, you 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 had a good list of let's say the kind of diseases we have in the oil and gas industry, and and what do you think? could be a way to, let's say, build down the hurdles um, and, and get, let's say, because like yourself, there's many highly talented, uh, fantastic AI companies, software companies, and you can do a lot of things. I'm, 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 I know that. So um, what would be a key point to get the direction into, let's say, reducing time to market, exploring more agile development, etc.? From your perspective i think there has to be a, a philosophical change uh towards the way this is done where where does innovation take place if you have a philosophical belief that the intern the organization will create all of its products and deploy it for its customers uh then that's one thing um our ceo uh, used to work for procter and gamble and he told me a story when he was at procter and gamble that that CEO was the first person he ever met that went to his team and said, we're going to make a decision that 80% of our innovation in the future is going to come from outside the company. And philosophically made it so that they went out and found other types of innovators and brought them in. Uh, I'm sitting here in an office and I have a couple of other software companies that are in this office as well. And one of them recently came back from a meeting where they did a demo and uh, the CEO had brought the company in and, it, and it, the demo, I mean, it went well, but there was a product manager in the room who spent, spent the entire time trying to figure out how to shoot him down. And he was really confused as to what was going on. Afterward, the guy basically told him, he said, well, I did my best to make sure you wouldn't get a chance. So if there's yeah. a belief that we have to preserve our jobs, we, we have to do everything internally, and that's the only way it's gonna work, then we'll never break up the vertical uh, chain and, and be able to allow organizations to come in and build, um, build things that would then provide benchmarks across the industry. Because everyone can build their unique one internal models for this or that, but when you have one company that does it for 30 or 40 of them, then you learn a lot. You learn a lot and you build benchmarks across the industry 
because now you have expertise that is um, that can see across different problems and, and actually learn from them. So um, one way of thinking about it that, that we see uh, from this side. Uh, the other part of it is a little bit about how the money goes, right? So, you know, uh, if, if the people who provide money to the industry uh, and this, a large number of them are strategic uh, investors, uh, if, they're, if, they, if they provide money that looks like R&D project money and it's, it's a hedge, we'll, hire, we'll get four or five of these outside companies and we'll do it internally ourselves, and then see what works. And that's very different than you know, putting, a, putting a bet on a horse and saying we really want it to win. And um, I, feel like, uh, I feel like there's a little bit of a difference between the way venture capital works and strategic investors work. And, uh, and that can also change the dynamics of how quickly time uh, there's an expectation of products to market. Hopefully that answers some of it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So maybe going back to Federico again, I mean, here you see, a I mean, of course, there's a lot of aspects as a, let's say, tech, tech company, startup, uh, the, the agenda and, and uh, purpose, how, how to get there. But of course, many of these are talented. I mean, how do you allow in your, let's say, uh, ideation, etc. Working with new technology. Do you invite tech companies into this, or, or how does it work really with Repsol, for instance? Okay, thanks, Amika, and, and perhaps I, I'm probably going to piggyback uh, also some of some of the comments uh, that Aruna did because yeah. I think she's uh, right uh, right on target. Uh, so bef before I go to that uh, that answer, uh, Mika, I, I'm I'm with uh, with uh, with Aruna 100%. I mean, we there is uh, when when you, when you I I've been sitting down right now in uh, in Repsol in years and years some technology development, you know, really custom customize uh, uh, and great investments, but uh, the the real exponential power of that uh, we are finding when. Uh, when you go and reach out uh, to other similar competencies, when you try to find out strategic alliance on complementary ways to do things, uh, and um, rather than having that situation, sometimes it's where you feel that a lot of people are working in, in the same type of product, which sometimes I have the feeling when, uh, when of course, we're trying to look into what products are in competition with uh, with with ours, so that concept that that ties also to the the open innovation uh, piece, uh, which is uh, well, uh, when when we go outside outside the box of this uh, industry secrecy, and uh, how do we open the doors to open innovation? The role of uh, venturing capital, I, I think there is uh, uh, one more standard uh, or of venturing capital familiar way of doing the things that we see today. And, and another one that is the what it should be. So the the, the startups actually have a, a DNA that is really quick. Uh, they they go into uh, uh, pain points, problem solving, and they are really agile, really agile. So when uh, these investments are done and you're trying to to push the incubation is what I say of these uh, these uh, startup these startup companies, what what happen is that uh, the oil and gas uh, sector, for example, or energy companies are, are putting the money and then they offer uh, data or they offer opportunities to apply that. But it's still like a two groups that are separate. So I think there is another level of, of the open innovation that some some companies are, are trying, we are trying this uh, in, in, inside Repsol too, which is more like looking into that uh, partnership relationship, you know, and uh, so that the, the startup doesn't see like the energy companies uh, perhaps more like the anchor effect uh, that is slowing me down eventually to uh, kick off uh, new technologies in a quick way. And uh, but contrary that they, they actually see it also as uh, that complementary and that uh, supplementary way to uh, to extrapolate that the value that they can obtain through the development of uh, products in that in that startup. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and maybe a bit like uh, let's say like Aruna said a bit that okay you you might build a let's say a startup builds a, 
fantastic race car for one one track but then when you go to the other track meaning other customer they said no no you have to build a new car to race here so uh, how how can we let's say find ways that when, when um, uh, a technology or an improvement is accepted approved by one emp company is there a recipe to say that well this could actually work also for others without uh let's say reinventing it again is there a clear clear path there what would be your let's say advice on that federico yeah would sorry you, you, you broke up uh, in a period of time in which we were formulating oh. the question would you say it again sorry yeah let's say that I'm, I'm tapping into a bit what Aruna has been uh, saying here also with tech. Uh, let's say you, when tech companies come and um, they approve some or develop and approve something with an EMP company, what could be a first step to also say that also other companies, EMP companies could adapt that without having all that hassle and frustration to have to start up or start from the scratch again? Oh, okay. Um... Well, look, I, th I think that uh, where where we are getting today, the Mika is uh, is with with all this situation that we are living, and I'm going to make the, the analogy of the pandemic is that the the level of uh, of color of collaboration among the companies is is expanding uh, uh, exponentially. You know? um, Perhaps uh, I'm going to tie the, something that Pablo was mentioning before because Repsol is part of the of the OGCI. Uh, but for example, finding or aligning the same purpose across companies is critical to ensure that uh, you just don't do that redoing and redoing. The, the OGCI is, for example, uh, a, a perfect case. It's the oil and gas climate uh, initiative, and the the investment each participant which are around 12 actually put uh, i mean it's going to invest around 100 million uh, euros each one so the that uh ogci actually works in two different uh, group of uh, activities uno is to develop uh, like uh, they call the kickstarters actually is the cc us hubs i mean where you can do storage of uh, of uh, co2 but also it has a component of uh, of venture capital in which aligning all the purpose of all these 12 companies uh, they identify which are the so they screen down which are the startups that actually are uh, looking specifically into the the pain points of these companies and and i would say that you guarantee in that way a uh, few things i mean one is that you put capital uh, that is serving different companies uh two uh, that you have an opportunity for these startups that look for in the in most of the time are thirsty to find out application uh, opportunities of their products to test so you offer now a platform of testing and then somehow i mean you can not only help them for testing but that use them uh, as uh, with a final objective that is defined under that organization. I think these type of initiatives are great uh, to consolidate the efforts and find more uh, convergency in the in the way that we operate with startups. Yes, definitely. Thank you. We have a question here from the audience on the carbon capture side in terms of the main risk elements and uh, yeah, concerning the carbon price. Uh, and I think that ties back to Pablo's uh, presentation there. So maybe yeah. you want to comment yeah. on that one. Sure. Am I on? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. OK, so so that's uh, the, the most complicated of the business models that I presented. So how to make that economically feasible? So as you can understand, uh, and you may have seen, I was speaking about carbon capture. That means that then you have to see what are you going to do out of that carbon if you're going to store it or if you're going to use it right so uh, and then there is a big part which is pushed by the government and by the corporate actions willing to spend money on that so the what i was showing are the technologies these are not the business model that justifies it how a project is justified so if you are going to do carbon capture and storage you're not going to get any profit 
so out of it. So it's going to be because there is a price, as you said. So yes, a business model based on that price is totally 100% dependent on that price. So what, what benefit you take? But there are other projects with the uh, concern utilization. For example, we are studying a project of uh, carbon capture in another on, of our waste to energy plants where the carbon is going to, the CO2 is going to be fed for greenhouses to improve the production of, uh, of uh, vegetables. So in that case, the CO2 is going to have a, a, a price. So it's not only about the, the, the price of the CO2 in, uh, as, as credits. And then, um, what else I was going to say, so, so there are there are cases in which uh, this can be justified economically, but I uh, know. Uh, yeah, what I was going to say is that on the side of the technology, it is uh, in all cases uh, valid that the cheapest and the less energy we can spend in doing it, provided that business models justify it. In all cases, the the less the most economical. A solution is going to be be bringing some of these projects below below the um, um, how do you say the the, the break even price. Okay, so for us, while we assume that this the market is being created, there's no doubt about the trend that we have, which is making that more 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 effective and less costly. So so that's enough for us to work, and then. As I said, we work on both sides of the country. So some of our projects belong to our own group. So at the same mm -hmm. time, we're working on, on trying to make a business models viable. But on my part, I was exposing is innovation is driven towards making it uh, cheaper. Yeah, yeah. So uh, talking about that cheaper, etc., and, and uh, let's say the b viable business models, etc. Here's also another question from um, the audience to Aruna. And it's relation related to the innovation and development there. What kind of uh, let's say? When do you think that the company should feel the urgency to be supported by external support? Okay. Yeah, I saw the question. It's a good one. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, and I work in operations, so you think about when do you bring in an outside help? And one of them is probably when it's not your core expertise. So if it's not your core expertise and, uh, you know, it's going to take you, you know, three months to go find the right person, then another six months to do the specifications and build the product. And you're looking at a timeline that's um, out there versus the potential benefit of getting an answer faster. Uh, I think that's when you look at external support. So if you're core expertise, you don't have an organization that does it. Um, that's that's going to be one area. And then two might be if you look at that uh, particular workflow and you say, uh, can I can I gain something from working with someone who may have already had a lot of expertise working with other people in the same area? In other words, uh, building everything in house means you learn from your own information only. You don't necessarily get the perspective of other organizations and what they may have gone through. So. Uh, in both cases, uh, it comes down to, you know, what is your timeline to market for solving the problem? What is the benefit that you get from solving it? And um, and do you have that internal capability now? Or and what can you, what is the cost of waiting, basically, to not have that capability? Um, so I think that those are all perspectives you can think about when you decide that. And you may end up also building your own capabilities while you work with other people. But that shouldn't mean that you should just wait and not have something out there or, or make progress towards it if it's material to the business. No. No, thanks. I mean, it's not just to be in love with your own product, if you understand it. It's, I mean, we have to reach out. We have to collaborate, understand the business value, et cetera, around it. So um, let's move on here. And I see another very interesting topic here or question from the audience. Uh, on the HSC side, um, which was the, uh, yeah. Do we have tech innovation around safety for rigs and other offshore installations today? And that might be a good one for Federico here now. Thanks, uh, Mika. 
a um, it's uh, I would say that it's, it's amazing uh, how uh, technology and innovation is playing a key role on safety. So safety, one of the client, and not only that, is one of the priorities of uh, of uh, most of the of, of the in uh, most of the energy companies that I know. So how that has been materialized? Well, in multiple ways. I mean the the one thing that you might have uh, heard is, uh, and, and actually the picture that you were using at the beginning of TC, uh, Mika, is uh, the digital twins, no? Uh, the technology has been, uh, has got to a point in which you can basically replicate the the process and uh, your PFDs, your PNIDs, uh, your uh, maintenance plans and everything from a remote operation. Uh, this is this is tangible today. I mean, at the end of the day, the I mean, actually, in uh, here in, in Repsol, we have uh, what we call in, in Wales. This is this is a, a remote uh, drilling operations center. It's uh, it's currently following. I mean, twenty four hours a day, all the activities associated to drilling and completion in our global footprint in the in the world. So how that uh improve the safety so well imagine that you are not right now operating in the field but at the same time you have a support team which is in, in our case is centralized in madrid uh, through this uh, operating center and uh, and you have the best level of experts at uh, at real time following up but not following up only with re reactive scenario but they are constantly looking also lagging uh, leading indicators so that uh, every component that right now is from a digital twin replicated from the operations can actually bring the critical value to get decisions made running time before the, you are facing uh, safety conditions. Then there is a, a bunch of other products. I mean, I was uh, uh, looking not long time ago into uh, ways that you do in virtual training. And a lot of the companies are, are getting into a situation in which uh, I was mentioning about the PFDs, the PNIDs. Uh, I remember in my time and joining the industry, I was still working on uh, blueprints sometimes. And uh, and you you will have to be really good to understand the the special um, room that you will have to perform a maintenance activity that was as simple as uh, isolating a system and take a, uh, do a change or um, a management of change and change above. Today, I mean, you can replicate all that through the, through uh, 3D uh, virtual vision, as uh, you can place all that 3D system and actually make uh, people uh, or your workers, train your workers to face uh, uh, each of the, the real experience that they have to face in the field. Yeah, thank you. I've, the, the, and this is, let's say, I would like to add something to this uh, as a question. Also, if you look now, uh, what's happening in the industry sector with the layoffs, exodus of, of experienced people. And uh, how do we then ensure that we can keep on innovating and implementing new technology safely? Or is it actually uh, <laughs> innovation ensuring this? Is there a clear answer on this from your perspective, Federico? Uh, sure, <laughs> put a trending topic in there that yeah. is not, not easy to address. Um, look, th there is a um, there is a natural path of uh, evolution in which uh, the things that we were doing before and the way that we were doing before are not anymore applicable. So our business evolves, and therefore uh, the competencies evolve, and uh, and then that brings together into a source, some sort of uh, refreshment of the footprints uh, of uh, resources in the in the different companies. This is not only applicable to oil and gas. Uh, if uh, more specifically, with an example, no? the um, uh, here in Tech Lab, I was mentioning before that uh, we, this is where we just try for our R and D. We decided uh, some years ago that uh, in the technology pathways that we were seeing coming, uh, a new element of competencies in our day-to-day -day activities was coming together with some mathematics, advanced mathematics. Uh, uh, it's a sort of, uh, of new pool of resources 
that uh, are connecting us to the world of uh, the the modeling, the artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we were thinking also, I mean, how do we prepare for the future when we are working already in a context in which sometimes the 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 solutions that we are working with we don't know how has been originated but we have to trust them somehow because they are even better than the solutions that we could have so you enter into a, a dilemma no and that dilemma is something that you are finding even with self self driven vehicles etc but to narrow the question yes you perhaps generate some some uh, some exits a natural flow of exits but at the same time you are also creating uh an incoming flow of new competencies uh the mathematics uh, advanced mathematics what we call uh goes through the uh the tech lab then these mathematicians that uh, have not been necessarily exposed to the business get a direct uh, um, uh, relationship with the business uh, with the product owners and apply to product development and the concept is that with time eventually you develop or fill that gap that we have today, for example, in having a computational geoscience. A computational geoscience is a person that eventually will have the capability to understand some of the products that uh, we are generating and implement it without uh, uh, going through that blocking mindset of adopting technology in the in the organization. Mm -hmm. Very well. So, I mean, of course, uh, there's a lot more happening with the algorithms, digitalization, etc. There's also need for the human factor, of course, to make this happen. And uh, the situation we have, and and let's say the pandemic now, how is this in a way pushing or prohibiting the digitalization to to take place? Aruna, what's your opinion on this? How is the pandemic uh, affecting yeah. the it, ability for digitalization it, to take place? Yeah. Um, I think that it's it's a it's a significant impact because what's happened is that it's it's a combination of the pandemic and the oil price crash, obviously, and it just has put most com a lot of companies in disarray to where you know what was already a, a difficult uh, process to you know allocate budgets and know who were owners and product managers responsible for certain things. Uh, those things become in flux. And uh, people have difficulty trying to make decisions about, you know, where where they are versus and where the company is is going. And so, I think that uh, all of that is uh, taken a bit of a stall. I do think that some of the health safety issues, uh, some of the remote monitoring, uh, <clears throat> Federico, you you talked about, uh, some of those types of things have some opportunity to make some headway because, again, you're dealing with l direct less man count sort of things when you have uh, some of those applications out there, computer vision applications that look at some of those things. But um, any areas that require a lot of data manipulation, I think may have more uh, struggle right now. Um, data is uh, the data problem. I don't know when this industry will solve the data problem. Maybe when every oil field has high performance IoT mm -hmm. sensors and you know, all the data looks similar, but right now the data is uh, is the biggest problem. And uh, again, it's uh, everybody has kind of decided they're going to build, for the most part, their own variety and and set. And in in it until that changes, uh, it's going to continue to be a problem. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So, if we look then, let's say, in ten years' time. Uh, with all these things taking place. Pablo, what, what do you think? What's your vision of the oil and gas production offshore? <laughs> Where are we going? Well, if I had the crystal ball, I'd be very happy. I would put in my <laughs> my events very clearly. Now, let me say, so Mika, uh, you yeah. know that, uh, uh, as Aruna said, with, with the price uh, crashes in, a, in, a, in a Q1 and the COVID, in, in personally, we were uh, we were expecting to have a huge blow in our activity to the sector, and we have a very hard Q, uh, half one, and uh, quite surprisingly, in the second half of the year, we saw 
a few mega projects in the offshore moving ahead. So, so in Senegal, as I said, and in Brazil, two big FPSO that are going to be positioned. And these are lease contracts that we are going to there for 15, 20 years. So the offshore sector and the deep offshore has a quite a healthy pipeline. So in spite of, of, uh, of the trend that, uh, as I said, I see is coming to stay. So, so at the point, it's going to be a peak in oil. Sometimes it is already passed. It's sometimes it, some says it's coming in the next year. It's going to be an impact for sure. But uh, I, on our side, we we see sustainable activity to to keep uh, putting our efforts in, in, in the offshore. Yeah. Yeah, that, I that's me, me in ten years, yeah. what in ten years is going to be? I I I I, I really struggle to cope with the change, uh, Mika. What you see behind here is my new office. So I used to have a nice office. I went yeah, exactly. on lockdown at home, and I finally passed to work on a regular basis from home, and that's it. I'm going to be traveling less because I'm sure each time when when I wanted to to go to a big meeting or or I wanted to bring my CEO to a meeting, we have to travel. Now it's, it's working very well. I have people doing startup who are buying the, the Google glasses so we can have an expert not going to site. Things are going into a change that is so fast that uh, I, I, and then, you know, maybe you even, I think there was a report on the recovery scenarios and how, sh I think it was from Shell, how they are playing with, with three different ones. And the, the, the scenarios are, are, are quite radically different one to the, the other. So, I mean, what is clear is that uh, uh, as uh, transition progresses, the, the, the big projects that are in the, low, in the low range of cost, they're going to keep going. And some of these mega offshore fields are keep, uh, keep being uh, profitable. So once again, I don't know for how long each of the projects we go now to, 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 to invest and to work for are, are for, for, for kind of a two decades one so i see yeah. sustainable activity change is taking place change is happening fast and change is the only constant in that sense so uh, federico what do you think about the pandemic effects uh from repsol side yes i, I was uh, actually listening uh Arun, I, I wanted to complement with something and just just giving a, a, a reality check. No, I mean, I, I, t I tend to, to to get always the positive side of things, but uh, I I think it's it's been amazing in regards to how fast has allowed us as a catalyzer to move into a completely different way of working. And uh, I'm still a firm believer that the 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 face to face and the and the human relationship has to be in our core of activities. But why why I'm saying that? Because not too many times in in history you have the you know usually when we talk about product development and uh, and I'm talking about digitalizations and things like that, you say that you always need to have something that the client needs and the user needs. And then you you have to debate with all these biases and the different interpretation. The the pandemic put the situation of working remote, of working with new tools, of working in a different dynamics, in a, in a context of adoption because you have to. I mean, it didn't give us an option. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm calling from Madrid. I mean, the people that are over seventy that could not go outside. I mean, they have to use their apps to order the food to get it home. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that applies also to the way that we have been working. I mean, everyone start becoming teams, like the meetings, I mean, right? I mean, to be honest, uh, I, mean, I just don't go anymore to meetings that are late, <laughs> if you think about it. It's, uh, in that case, it's amazing. Of course, you have some things that we need to, we need to work because sometimes I mean, uh, people are still getting up to speed with some of the tools that we're using on the ways of working. And perhaps now we have far away more work to do because people are connected all the time and we are not using Teams only, but emails also, and also WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. So you feel like an overburden on all of this. But the truth is that in a short period of time, we have done a huge change. I mean, in the, in the way that we are adapting 
products that were there available to use. And this is not only for the ones that we use for our life, but also this applies to the, the oil and gas industry. And uh, things that were in a debate at the beginning of whether or not we were using it. I mean, that conversation didn't even exist. I mean, we move immediately into using them. And uh, I think that's what's something that I wanted uh, to mention. And, uh, and and perhaps on the on uh, on the topic of Pablo of the crystal ball piece, which is a really difficult question. Um, I, I see, and, and, and Pablo is getting more exposure to that CCUS uh, um, uh, project, like at the T site in the in the UK. But if you see the time frame of these products, uh, it's like a five years uh, of these projects. Uh, five years you you are doing CCUS, mm -hmm. even if we are doing it already in some of the projects in uh, in Norway and also in in the United States. But I I think there is a part in there in which the oil and gas. Uh, uh, has some competencies, like competencies in developing big projects, competencies in the in the earth understanding, in the subsurface, that even though a lot of the business models in this energy transition are evolving, it, they are creating a fitting uh, opportunity to that uh, pool of resources or competence, compet competencies. And therefore, the oil and gas, I see, I think that the oil and gas, and there was an article about this, I don't remember who wrote it down, is kind of moving towards three paths. I mean, uh, a transformation business, a decarbonization business, or an, opportuni an opportunistic business. No? And, uh, and the European companies are facing strongly uh, the, the push towards, uh, but not only because of the push of the, of the social pressure, but because this is, this is a consciousness that the company is taking as a um, promoting their companies and, uh, and the ESG and uh, sustainable companies. But uh, this, uh, these companies more and more are going to, uh, through that energy transition, perhaps are going to create integrated models with the oil and gas and create uh, new opportunities. Like the CCUS is one, perhaps in some of the offshore facilities, you will start uh, generating uh, hydrogen or so other type of fuel for transportations. And uh, you will have high, green hydrogen because you will be close to the proximity of uh, the wind farms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I see from five years to 10 years starting to material and ma materialize more all these projects that are already in the plans of the companies and uh, closing the gap of the uncertainty that is associated to the, are these economically viable or not? And together with the, the supply and demand situation of the oil and gas, the oil and gas will uh, will be probably more integrated to the other side of the business. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, so we hear that, let's say, uh, energy companies are, let's say, changing their business plot or <laughs> business models a bit, uh, bringing new messages there. Also that there's a need for, let's say, new type of competencies, etc. So. Uh, Aruna, how does this the oil and gas is it attractive and and how how to get the right talents to support this from your perspective? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting question. You know, I mean, I have a I have a younger children who you know ask questions about things like this because you know, like I said, they they're kind of growing up with a different sort of mentality and. Um, and I think that, you know, we have to own the message of the sector about how important what we do is. And, and while while as as our co-panelists are, are doing in their companies, you know, uh, bringing forth the messages that we are, you know, socially responsible and are doing the, the socially responsible things uh, to make sure that we preserve the planet. So um, I think that we can attract them, but it will have to start a little earlier. You know, I don't think that uh, waiting uh, it might be as innovative as looking at, you know, pulling closer down the value chain at the, the high school levels to inform and educate more students about what what the sector really is and what what all it can do, and and um, and and demonstrating that it's a, a good option, you know, uh, as opposed to waiting and letting all those influences kind of uh, stack up by the time they get to college or whatever and deciding and it could also be you know things that uh we may not be thinking about today like for example uh i know that 
Google and, and uh, some of the other tech companies that have started to build their own certification programs. And uh, those certification programs, you know, you can, with certain qualifications underneath you, you can go straight into them and, uh, and then come out working for Google even if you never went to college. So there, there are different ways of thinking about how to attract the talent and, and build alternative pathways to ensure that we have uh, the people we need. And, um, and it may be fewer people than we use today. And part of having fewer people than we use today is gonna be um, that virtual training and, and virtual and other types of uh, automation and AI that allows for more things to be done by fewer people. Yeah. I just a quick comment on that because you know oil and gas is not the only one but because I've seen also high school kids or or young younger uh, yeah uh, children also think about manufacturing industry oh it's dirty old manual work and then you have the industry 4.0 and an adaption of of IoT etc so I think that is I really support that we have to give a clear message and start educate early on that what, what's going on in the sector because and because that is key in terms of attracting also future talents into this but um so i'm thinking we are starting to get late into the uh, panel session but if we say that what kind of uh, if there's a single advice what pablo what would you give uh, say to aspirational innovators <laughs> or the future talent. <laughs> Any advice if they want to come into oil and gas? And innovators in general. Yeah. Is there a way to, to make a quick success or or uh, what, what can they avoid? Let's say to, to make it happen or be successful. Is there something that you think is key? in terms of making it happen making no, an li li listen our uh, own experience first is, is of course uh, do not fear a uh, failure so i mean uh, give yourself the right to, to fail really fail fail as many times as necessary second one which is really one from experience on how, how to promote a, a not about only external uh, innovation also in internal so ours is a big uh, big uh, very big organization with a lot of I, I won't say silos, but people knowing what they know in their in their corner, and, and uh, you don't happen you don't happen to know what they know. So there is a lot about sharing, lot lot about sharing, sharing, sharing. So each mm -hmm. time, even things we 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 do, some people may tend to want to keep it for ourselves. I always push to publish and to exchange. So each time you go and you exchange, you get uh, you you. you you, I said to, 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 to promote this exchange, you go and speak yourself, open up, show what you know, and you're going to get. So I, I, I strongly believe in transversal and collaborative approach, something I didn't mention, how to promote this internally. We've been working quite a lot on EOR and also on this uh, on CO2. We happen to find a lot of things that have been done in the company that have not been colliding into these initiatives. If it wasn't because that we created the kind of uh, communities of practice where, where people is brought and where, where we collaborate. So strongly and highly believe in, in enriching innovation through through open uh, and transversal collaboration. Very good, very good. So Federico, you, you, have, you are an optimistic guy. So, so should we innovators just uh, suffer or, or should we still believe that it's, it's possible? What, what, what's your opinion on this? How, what's your piece of advice to innovators? Yes, I, I guess I guess some message when I close my presentation will probably will add a few things. So I mean, just uh, one one year ago is when I I joined the uh, technolo technology for uh, for Repsol EMP, and uh, and is there something that I have enjoyed the most in this world of the technology innovation is when they prove me wrong, no? And usually when you come from a, a mentality that is more, you know, pragmatic, the free cash flow, the money, the efficiencies to bring incomes to the company at this, that short vision, uh, it's uh, it's sometimes hard to step out. And, uh, and what I was mentioning, no? give, give, put time in your agenda to, to do innovation. And I think that has to be applied to everyone, not only to the innovation people, but also for, for us to be more welcoming on any idea. So, 
in these lines, I would say that innovators need to have a strong soft skills in perseverance. I mean, perseverance, uh, this, this goes together, of course, to listen. I mean, because you, you have to work with a, with a client and owner, but sometimes, I mean, you will find people that you don't have to listen. So you need to just follow your, your guts and, uh, and, uh, and move forward with the ideas because uh, in many times I've been in the situation that they have proved me wrong and uh, I'm really, really happy when these type of things happen. If I am actually providing the room for that uh, for that to happen, and that's why I'm asking everyone to just think in an innovative way uh, uh, every time that you are facing situations in your life. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let me ask you just a quick poll here between the three of you. Also, let's say because one KPI and important factor is the oil price always. So. If we think one year ahead, December 2021, and you know, we can go back and check with this video too. <laughs> so what's your opinion? Are we less than 30 US dollars per barrel, bit, between 30 and 50 or above 50? Where are we going in, in a year's time? Maybe start with you, Federico. <laughs> no, it's from say that. Uh, I wish when I see this video in 10 years time from now, I mean, I see myself with the headset and I don't think that I was a DJ at this time, but uh, to, your, <laughs> to, to your question of, uh, of the barrel. Uh, look, DJ I think, uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I, I, I would say that uh, uh, 50 plus minus 10%, uh, but to support, you know how it is, okay? but. Uh, to, to support, since you are giving me one year time frame, so it's not that far away, uh, is that uh, I I see recession, but I see also a recovery in regarding to uh, the, you know, this pandemic uh, with uh, now the vaccines that are available. So perhaps I think this society needs to, to get out a little bit. Uh, so there is some reestablishment of, uh, of some of the trading markets and, uh, Supply and demand. I'm, I'm more worried about uh, perhaps what's the, the the side effects of all of this, and that uh, perhaps we are not seeing it that clear. But uh, that's that's my number. Yeah. Over to you, Aruna. What, what do you think? Yeah, I was walk. I live in Houston, and I was walking in my neighborhood, and I, I kid you not, there was a bumper sticker on a car, and it said make oil 80 dollars a barrel again <laughs> there's your so, there's your answer yeah so <laughs> i'm gonna care. so that person definitely knows and of course yeah. uh you know it would do great for the economy i would say i'm gonna say between 30 and 50 i mm -hmm. be conservative um but um i hope i, I really hope that uh that dollar value doesn't impact all of what happens with innovation in the next year mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. uh, that that really it creates a lot of disturbance, and it, it's not just a short-term disturbance when companies leave the sector or or people leave. Yeah. So you have the final saying here, Pablo. What's the I, right? I give another, but you have to say yours as well, Mika. Okay, I will go straight on fifty, and I'm very happy to pay the VR because I'm really looking forward to have a VR with someone. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I go on 50, uh, and if I'm the, the, the farthest, I'll pay the beer with a pleasure. And what about you? Yeah, you know, I, I am an optimistic guy myself, so I, I would like to say about 50, but I think it will take time to recover. And uh, I tend to say that, well, I believe it's going to be there in the range 30 to 50. Uh, by this time end of next year but at the same time i think we learn a lot of new skills uh, ways of interacting doing business so i i want to also let's let's say agree with aruna say that i hope this doesn't let's say impede the innovation and innovation rate in that sense we, we still need to innovate a lot in in the future times for oil and gas or let's say the, the, the new way of producing energy in, in the energy transition period here. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think that that would, uh, we can round off the whole panel session there. I 
have enjoyed this very much myself, being the moderator and listening to all your uh, shared wisdom here. So uh, I want to express my gratitude and appreciation to Aruna, Pablo, and Federico for sharing this, as well as to the O2C organization, as well as the AICHE. And uh, I hope also that you have enjoyed this session. A big thank you to all of you. Thanks. So stay safe. Keep on innovating and enjoy the seasonal celebrations when that time comes. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for the organization. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot, Thanks a lot everyone.